All right. Hello, everyone. This is another special episode of the Unisoft question. And uh, this is another judicial episode of the Unisoft question. Today's guest is Honorable Madam Justice Jasmine Agbarli. Good morning, Justice Agbarli. Good morning. This is a great opportunity for me and for our audience. You are one of the most interesting judges in uh, Toronto, I think probably in Ontario. And I've heard several people express interest in uh, hearing from you. That's why I think that's why we are having this interview today because there is interest in the audience. As usual, I want to start with explaining to our audience that you're also a human being, that you know judges are people. And uh, please tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how that went. Sure. Well, uh, before I get started, I need to do the obligatory. Uh, my comments during this podcast reflect my views. I don't speak for the Superior Court of Justice as a whole. I'm here in my personal judicial capacity, I guess. Um, I grew up in Mississauga. My parents were both immigrants. My dad immigrated from Pakistan. My mother immigrated from Finland. Uh, and, you know, we grew up without a lot of family here. Family was all abroad. Um, so it was just the four of us, my parents, my sister and I, um, and I guess, you know, a fairly standard suburban upbringing uh, and eventually, you know, went through school and made it to law school, which I kind of had always wanted to do when I was in high school. Like if you found my high school yearbook, it says that I was going to be a judge. I always knew I wanted a career in the law, wavered a little bit in undergrad. Um, but uh, eventually landed in law school and and uh, worked there for a while. I clerked for a year at the Supreme Court of Canada for my articles and uh, then returned to practice in Toronto. I practiced first corporate commercial litigation and then I moved into uh, appeals, mostly civil appeals and some pro bono appellate work that also branched out into criminal. And, uh, and then after about 20 years at the bar, uh, I got my appointment and I've been sitting on the Superior Court of Justice now for about five years. That's the fastest uh, bio <laughs> that I heard from any guest that also <laughs> at the same time is quite dense. Uh, I, I want to ask you about Justice John Major at the Supreme Court of Canada. You, of course, now have joined the, uh, the long list of guests of the show who clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada. And you clerked for Justice John Major. What can you tell us about uh, Justice John Major? So he was so funny. I mean, I'm sure he still is. Um, but it was uh, it was something I quite enjoyed about him. He he had the driest sense of humor. And I remember before I got uh, the position clerking for him, around the time of his appointment, there had been some community groups that had you know gone public with their concerns. And somebody said, well, he's only been on the Court of Appeal for 11 months. And in that time, he's only written two decisions. And it turned out he'd written like 60 some or like some much. Anyway. And Justice Major was quoted as saying, well, I knew it was more than two. And that was really his, uh, it, it, that sense of humor percolated through everything. And so I enjoyed working for him um, because he really, uh, he left a lot of room for us to come in and engage on issues. There was a lot of space that, that he held for that. And he always treated our comments uh, as if they were valuable. And I remember sitting in his chambers and thinking, you know, here I am, you know, taking him on on some issue. And like, what am I? I'm some smart ass kid who just graduated from law school a few months ago. And, and he's sitting here at the pinnacle of his judicial career. Um, but, you know, he always listened and sometimes he would move a little based on some of the concerns. So he was very open minded, but it taught me a lesson really early on, which is that um, it's important to treat everybody with respect, right? Because no matter where you are in the profession, no matter how junior or senior, you've always got something to learn. You've always got something to teach. Right. I heard that when you were appointed in uh, 2016 as uh, the judge of the Superior Court of Justice in Toronto, you were the first South Asian woman appointed to any provincial Superior Court in Canada. Is that correct? 
I don't know if that's correct. I was certainly the first South Asian woman appointed in Toronto. Um, it, there may have been another judge in Ontario, but I'm not sure. Uh, that was not known to Saba, the South Asian Bar Association at the time. And I can't say for sure about other provinces. I think there may have been provincial court judges or, or um, superior court level judges in BC perhaps, but uh, there's certainly been a lot of appointments that followed me, um, you know, in Toronto and, and elsewhere. Yes. And I wonder if you uh, also were the first Finnish woman appointed to the bench in, uh, in Ontario. <laughs> That's entirely possible. I can tell you this for sure, though. <laughs> I was the first Finnish Pakistani woman appointed to the bench anywhere in Canada. <laughs> You know, uh, speaking of fun, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Justice John Major and his sense of humor. Uh, I found the, uh, the learner's uh, announcement about your appointment. It's a very brief statement on their website, uh, pu published on October 21st, 2016. And they congratulate you. They're very proud of you. And then they describe you uh, by saying, we will miss her legal excellence. That's understood. Okay and fun-loving charm around the office. So what was that about? What is the fun-loving charm? What are they referring to? Um, oh, well, I guess to really know, we'd have to ask them, but you know, with that, I always like to have some fun where I am, you know, within appropriate confines, right? Like, so mm -hmm. some of the work we do is very serious, but we, just because we do serious work doesn't mean we have to take ourselves seriously. So, um, you know, if, an occasional prank, some jokes, like that's, that's I see. totally appropriate. <laughs> I see. I'm curious, so speaking of learners, did you get to work with Earl Chernyak at all? I worked with Earl a lot, yeah. Earl was great. Earl still is great. He's still a good friend of mine. So I, I can tell you, I personally met him at one of uh, Joe Groya's parties. And of course, Joe Groya has the best food in his parties. I don't know if you ever went. And uh, I was just standing at this um, Italian appetizer table and, uh, you know, trying to pick one of the many appetizers. And there was this um, man standing next to me and he was very sort of quiet and not pretentious. And I, I didn't really know who he was. And we started chatting and then we introduced each other. Uh, and then he said, uh, I'm Earl Chernak. And then I realized who I was talking to. And uh, uh, I, I remember I told him about my practice. I was just three or four years out. And he said, he asked me only one question. Do you have paying clients? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. And then he said, okay, then, then, then you're good. <laughs> anyway, so he, uh, one, one question about your appointment. When... Um, uh, you were appointed, the Government of Canada issued a press release, and uh, in the press release, uh, the, they said that you were appointed the judge, and you replaced Mr. Justice uh, D.J. Stinson, yes. who elected supernumerary, supernumerary status, um, effective May 2nd, 2016. So what does it mean for a new appointee to replace a judge? Do you get his cases? What what is no. going on? No, 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 no. It's it's really just a notional position thing. Like there's so many. The, the compliment is what it is of full time judges, and um, under the Judges Act, uh, judges can elect at a certain point in their career to go supernumerary, which basically allows you. I think you go down from thirty five sitting weeks to seventeen sitting weeks, uh, and. Um, but you you continue to get full salary for that and then there's another category called full-time supernumerary where you work more than 17 weeks you still get paid full salary and you get to keep your bigger office you don't have to move to a smaller office so um when you go supernumerary all you're doing is you're freeing up one of the positions in the full-time complement that has to be filled and so one of the reasons that the court likes supernumerary judges is because uh a they help us function because if we didn't have supernumerary judges our full-time complement would not be enough it what our complement today isn't enough but our full-time complement would not be enough to handle the workload uh, and b they have valuable experience um, and and so what they can offer in terms of you know sort of um, helping along younger members of the bench newer members of the bench but also just handling cases it's all it's very valuable 
Speaking of handling cases and speaking of the workload, I, I want to ask you about the situation right now at, at our Superior Court. And let's talk about Toronto. This is where I uh, practice. This is my home court. This is where a lot of other lawyers practice. This is where you work day in and day out. What's going on right now? What is the situation? We all heard about backlogs. What's going on? Please update us about it. Right. So the pandemic has caused a significant backlog. Um, and so some of the things that we have done to try to address it uh, include some of the triage uh, and conferencing that you are going to be seeing more and more of in your cases. Um, historically, Toronto has had a real motions culture. And what I mean by that is that cases can get motioned to death. Uh, and so what we are trying to do is to cut out some of the motions that really don't need to proceed. They could be resolved if people would just talk to each other. Uh, and so at a conference or through triage, we can do some of that. Um, you know, like if you go looking for a summary judgment motion, in many cases now at CPC, you'll be directed to a conference because we've just had so many summary judgment motions brought that really should be summary trials or uh, you know, aren't likely to succeed on summary judgment. And so they're not efficient. It's not an efficient use of the court's resources. It's not an efficient use of the party's resources. And we just don't have the bandwidth to be inefficient. Um, so that's, that's some of the things that we're doing. What we really need is an increase in complement. We don't have enough judges. If you look at the growth of the area that we serve uh, over time, population growth, and then you look at the growth in the bench, they don't match, right? The bench hasn't grown to match the growth in the population. And at the same time, cases have gotten more complicated, right? You've got all the electronic discovery. Um, people are now, uh, they, they're, um, their issues, I think, are growing. And here's the thing, like sometimes you'll get a really old school litigator in front of you has been around a long time and they show up and they brought their one issue. And that rarely happens with most litigators, right? Most of them come and they've got a whole boatload of issues to deal with. And I don't know if it's fear of getting sued if you don't bring everything, bring every issue you can think of. But the reality is like, if you were walking into a motion and you've got six issues, you probably know that six is dead in the water and so is five and four's got like very little chance of getting anywhere and three's a little shaky, but you still bring all six, right? I'm not talking about you personally. This is what we're seeing, right? right? Lawyers bring all six and, uh, and then we have to deal with all six. And everybody knew that over half of them weren't gonna go anywhere. So it's this performative exercise that we get put through and, you know, we have to deal with the issues that get raised, but it takes time, right? So people are doing this. They don't have the courage to say, these are my issues. These are the controlling issues. These are the ones I'm going to bring. And, and then we could focus on the real stuff. We could have shorter records. We could have shorter reasons. We could have shorter motions. We don't have that. We have longer everything. And so that's a change that's happened. So in addition to the growth of the population, the growth of the complexity of the cases, the growth of the document production, we've also got this growth of the issues that I think stems from people being too scared to really go with the strong issues. And, and so that's frustrating from my perspective because it, it's a time suck. It's a time suck. It takes me more time to prepare. It takes me more time to write. It takes me more time to sit through the motion and hear all the issues. And, you know, we're doing this for issues we all know aren't going to go anywhere. Why don't we just argue with the issues that are actually important, that are actually controlling? So, you know, you get that. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons why things back up, I think. And, and then people complain that they can't get dates. Well, you know, things would move a lot more efficiently um, in addition to the things that the administration of justice can do. And we can't, we don't control the complement, right? That's, that's the federal government decision of whether or not they increase our complement. Um, so it's not like the private sector where we can say, oh, our workload's pretty big right now. We better go out and hire some more people. Um, you know, so the, we need help. We need help from the bar to make 
our jobs more efficient. And one thing that people could do would be to, you know, have some courage and, and not bring every issue you can think of, right? Yes. Do you think that lawyers see judges as uh, service providers rather than partners in the justice system? Uh, do, you, do you think that lawyers expect uh, the court to work like a, a computer program or, or a black box where you push the button and you get the result? And if you don't get resu the result on time, then you get annoyed. Should they instead be looking at the justice system and at the judges and at the courts as partners and uh, stakeholders, just like lawyers, and where every stakeholder has to think about the uh, uh, the uh, the justice system, justice system as a whole, as well as their clients' interests? That's a really interesting question, and and actually, I'll be thinking about that one later today because. I'm not sure in a, that I've given thought in a long time to how lawyers view judges. And as I think back to my own career as a lawyer, uh, I'm not really even sure how I viewed judges back then. I, the, the judge was the person I had to convince, the judge was the person who was going to decide. Um, but you know, the reality is we are all members of the same system and it's a public service system. Your role as a lawyer uh, is less about public service than my role, right? I've got all of these people and some of them don't have lawyers. They come before me, they need help. Uh, and I have to make sure as best as I can that um, the, the court system is available to everybody and it's not just dominated by the people who can afford the, the fancy lawyers. Um, in, in the case of a lawyer though, your primary obligation really is to your client. And, um, so how should lawyers view judges maybe is a better question and or at least one I'm better able to answer. Um, but I think if your end goal is to serve your client's interests, then your end goal uh, manifests through making my life as easy as possible, right? Like it's the, the harder you make it for me, the more likely mistakes are gonna get made, the more likely things are gonna take more time. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that, um, lawyers do that are counterproductive, I think, to the goal of, of serving their clients' interests, and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. So you mentioned one of the ways that lawyers can make your life easier. Be brave about uh, selecting issues to bring before you. You asked how lawyers, uh, or I asked how lawyers uh, view judges. I, for example, view judges as uh, question answers. I ask them questions, and I, I I want judges to answer those questions. So you're essentially telling uh, us to ask you fewer questions in, in a proceeding. So let's say a motion, ask one question that really matters. What are some of the other ways that we can help judges um, with the workload and with their, with their job and help the justice system as a whole? So um, let me tell you, let me, oh, I'll get there, but let me start by just sort of explaining what my days and weeks look like. Uh, because I don't think, I think there's a bit of a, a, an opa opacity to that, that a lot of people don't know what we're doing um, or what are, you know, they, they see us when we show up in court and they get the reasons, but they don't see what's happening around that time. So um, we in Toronto were assigned to various teams. At the moment, I'm cross appointed to civil and class proceedings. Uh, so I have some weeks that are civil weeks and some weeks that are class proceedings weeks. Generally speaking, we get our schedule, like we're confirmed our hearings two days in advance, but not even a full 48 hours, right? Like usually it comes in late afternoon on a Tuesday for Thursday. Um, if it's a long hearing, court staff does try to give us a heads up the week before and access to case lines. But a lot of the times it's not helpful because case lines hasn't been populated yet or it hasn't been fully populated or it's been poorly populated. And I'll get to case lines in a minute because I have a lot to say about case lines. But um, the, the reality is that we don't have a lot of lead time to prepare, right? So that's one of the reasons why focus is so important because the more I have to prepare, the less time I have for each file, right? Like it's, it's if I've got, three hours of prep time available to me that day. And, um, and I've got several files that I need to prepare for and each one of them is taking 
more time because they're not focused materials, then, you know, I, I either am making time out of what, taking it out of my sleep. Um, and, you know, nobody likes, I can tell you, nobody wants uh, unslept me in the courtroom the next day. Um, or it's, it's um, it means that my preparation for each motion isn't as thorough as I would like it to be. So the, it's not ideal. And so we get the materials and then we've got, you know, hearings the next day. So it's not like I've got the whole day to prepare. I've got those hearings and I'm trying to do some reasons as I go along, right? I'm trying to get endorsements on the simpler things out as quickly as possible. So a few weeks ago, just to give you an example, uh, and this is a particularly bad week because for a number of endorsements, because I sat in CBC twice uh, that week, but in one week, I released 31 endorsements and I took two reserves. So that's, um, that's, that's at the high end, but it's not unusual. It's not unusual. So we've got this constant process of things going and that's just our hearings, right? In addition to that, we are speaking at things that we're preparing for, we're case managing files, which we tend to do around the regular day. So I'm, I'm having, conferences at, at 8.30, I'm having conferences at 4.30, I'm having conferences at 1.00. Um, so it, there's always something happening, right? It's, it's, it's like, um, though the, the image we often uh, invoke to each other is that, uh, you know, that old scene from I Love Lucy and the Chocolate Factory with chocolates just keep coming. That's, that's what the work is like, it just keeps coming. There's always something else and with the backlog, if something goes down, there's something to pick it up, right? Like there's there's something to fill in often if, if we have enough notice that something's gone down. So uh, last minute, things going down is also a problem for us because you put time into preparing something, you show up at the hearing and someone says, oh, my friend just delivered a new factum this morning and we've agreed that, you know, I need some time to respond to it. And so can we adjourn this? And this happens more than you would think even though there are timetables in place. And, and so, you know, and sometimes it's out of people's control, I get it, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just somebody hasn't focused on what they needed to do early enough. And then the whole day goes down, right? Now I can use that time because I've got reserves to write and whatever else and prep to do. So I'm, I make use of it when it happens. But, you know, it's also part of the reasons why your dates are so far off is because now that person took up a day in the calendar I spent time preparing, which is wasted time now, because, you know, even if it gets assigned to me when it comes back, I'm not going to remember. I'm going to have to look at it all again. You know, we do too much in a week to remember things. If, if your case is very clearly um, emblazoned in my mind, that is a sign that something is wrong. <laughs> it's a, there's a bad aspect to your case if it's emblazoned in my mind, right? So um, that's, that's an issue. The the last minute adjournments um, and just the the little prep time that we have and the overarching workload, which is like, I'm working way harder now than I did in practice, hands down, way harder. Um, you know, you, it is not unusual to find me at 1030 on a Saturday night working. So, and, and I'm not complaining about the workload. It's a, it's a job that I'm privileged to have, but, um, it's, it has to, there are so many things we could do to make it better and make it more efficient. And that's, I guess, where I would look to the bar for some more help. And, and a lot of that at the moment has to do with case lines because of the pandemic and this movement online. Um, another thing that that's meant for judges who are doing virtual hearings is that we don't have the staffing complement that we would have if we were in court, or at least not the staffing problem to do the things that they would normally do for us, right? So if I was doing CPC in person, I would have a stack of endorsements. I would handwrite them as I went along, and then I would hand them off to the registrar and I wouldn't think about it again. And so now what happens is that I pull up the form and uh, that CPC form it often gets populated in, I, I don't know what the error is, there's a technical error. And so when I go in to do my endorsement on the CPC form, all throughout the form, it's like where it should say court file number or the court file name, it says error reference source not found or something like that. So I end up going through and deleting 
error reference source not found everywhere and typing in the court file number and um, doing you know the endorsement and I can't finish them at the same time because I've got too many people waiting and so I sort of either take some notes and I go back to finish them after or I try to draft the endorsement but I don't deal with signing it saving it and all that stuff because that takes too much time and then it takes me a good hour hour and a half after CPC court to go through all those endorsements because what I have to do then is um, save them correct them well correct them then save them and then um, uh, convert them into pdf sign them save them again and then send them off to somebody to release them so you know these things they're not individually difficult but they take time and when you've got a whole bunch when you're doing 31 endorsements in a week i'm spending a lot of time converting into pdf so that's um that's an admin burden that's fallen on us now through the virtual proceedings that we never had before uh, and there's more, right? Like there's, I try to prep my files as soon as I get them because there's often things that are wrong in the file from case lines. And so I've taken to sending out emails saying, fix this, but it's problematic. I think, and I think one of the big problems is that lawyers aren't using case lines themselves or many aren't. Many are doing their documents, getting a hard copy for themselves and telling their staff to upload it to case lines and never checking. So really, how can, how can lawyers help us? Here's the number one thing you can do to help us. Use case lines yourself. Because if you use case lines yourself, you're not going to give me files that are not that are dysfunctional on case lines, right? And that's what I'm getting now. I'm getting a lot of dysfunctional files. Um, sometimes when people upload their factums, they get disaggregated. They don't know. And so overview is one document. Facts are one document. Issues are one document. And on and on. And that's not an efficient way of going through it. People often separate their exhibits from the affidavits because they think that's going to make them easier to find. But then you end up with plaintiff has 106 documents in their uh, case lines folder and defendant has 96. And, you know, I'm trying to find things and it's unruly. I can't find the documents. And people don't come with the case lines number. Sometimes they come with the PDF numbers if I'm lucky. And oftentimes they're just sitting there with their hard copy and they hand up, uh, they've uploaded, I should say, a motion record and it hasn't, either the bookmarks have been scrubbed or the hyperlinks have been scrubbed or it hasn't been hyperlinked. And I've got a PDF in front of me that's 5,000 pages long and, and someone says, could you please turn to tab 4NN? Well, I don't have tab 4NN on case lines, right? And I say, what's the case lines number? Well, nobody knows. So we gotta go searching and then and talk about wasting time. That's another time waster. Plus it's giving me tendonitis, scrolling, 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 scrolling. So the, the use of case lines is really problematic. Um, and lawyers would know that if they were using case lines, they would get as frustrated as I get, but they're not using case lines, they're using their briefs. So that's a huge, huge issue. Um, not knowing how to function with it and and not knowing how to navigate it. And even lawyers who know how to navigate it, here's the thing nobody does, or at least hardly anybody does, is you've got a motion record with a whack of tabs in it, and you tell me to go to tab uh, 2M. Well, I can do that because you've got it hyperlinked in your index, so I can go to tab 2M. And now you want me to go to tab 6F. Well, I can't just go back to, I have to scroll up all the way to the index to get the hyperlink to tab 6F. So every tab should have a hyperlink back to the index. So I'm just clicking to get back and clicking is two clicks, as opposed to this thing that takes a lot of time, right? These are the things people would see if they used it themselves, but they don't. So I lose all this time. So I've started now emailing counsel and saying, you've got to do these things to fix your case line material. But if I've already reviewed it, I've made notes on it, right? right. And so what am I doing? Am I like, so if I notice it's bad at the beginning, I'll tell people to fix it before I review it, and then I'll make my notes on the reviewed copy. But I've had it where I've, here's another thing people do. They, they find a mistake and they decide to go correct it without telling me. So I reviewed a document, I've made my notes in it, and somebody removes it from case lines and puts up a new copy of the same document. Well, goodbye, all of my notes, they're gone. Wow. So these are, the, the, you see what I'm saying? I got a lot to say about this. Yes. Um, these are some of the things that are really yeah. problematic that are making the process very inefficient and used properly in those rare hearings where people have it down pat. It's great. It's a really powerful tool. 
um, but it's the it's the exception, not the rule. And I still have people coming before me saying, "This is my first time using case lines." You know, I uh, I always use the presentation mode. How many lawyers do you, do you uh, in your experience use the presentation mode? Because in the presentation mode, you don't even have to touch your computer. I just change. I just scroll the document myself on your screen. Right. What do you think yeah. about the presentation mode? I have never had a single person use presentation mode. Wow. I have had people use direct to, um, which isn't bad, but the problem with direct to is that it really likes you to be at the top of the page. And so you scroll down and it bumps you back up to the top of the page. And I'm like, but I want to look at what's on the bottom of the page, or I want to look at the next page. And I can't, uh, because it keeps bumping me up. So that's, uh, that's, an issue with direct to I'm good at finding the page numbers myself but another thing that happens is that sometimes people use the master and sometimes people use the current and so you I need to know which set of page numbers you're using in order to find it but that becomes an issue is that someone says oh it's at page b-1-167 and I go to b-1-167 and it's not what they're talking about at all and it's because there's a difference between the current and the master and, and then people clutter, they upload all their affidavits to service. I do not need to see them if there is, if no one is taking an issue on service and if it is not X party, I don't need your affidavit to service, I really don't. So, and, and that just like clutters things up and, and nobody yeah. brings costs outlines. That's another one of my beefs. Yeah. So we'll talk about the cost outline in a second. I just want to finish with case lines. Would you prefer a lawyer that lawyers use the presentation mode where you don't have to touch anything? They just scroll the document on your screen. Have you I seen it in action? It. I haven't, but I've heard from people that it's really great. So I would be very open to that. Very so we open. should tell lawyers now that, that they should tr try presentation mode then <laughs> because in, in my experience, it's great. Uh, you don't have to touch your computer at all as a judge. You just watch a, a movie basically on your screen. Yeah. And, and the other side, the opposing party has the same movie on their screen, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's so, one of the great things about it, right? Is that everybody, it, like, especially if you're cross-examining a witness, right? Everybody knows what everyone's looking at. Whereas before in the courtroom, you know, you could show a document to the witness and the witness might say like, oh, it's this number over here. And then we all have to figure yeah. out what that means. Right. Yeah. Whereas uh, when when we're all looking at the same document at the at the same time, we see what's in front of the witness. And we can, it's easier to know what the witness is talking about. So tell us about the cost outline. You started talking about that. Right. So um, costs decisions are another really inefficient way of using judicial resources. Um, if I do costs and everybody wants to do written cost submissions for some reason. And occasionally there's a need for it, right? And I'm not saying that there's never a need, like trials, you need written cost submissions later and some complex motions where, you know, there might be divided success, there might be reasons for cost submissions later, or slap motions, anti-slap motions. But almost always, like I would say probably 90% of the things I hear do not need written cost submissions. So what the rules require you to come with a cost outline to a motion, right? And so few people do this. And everyone says, oh, I haven't done it yet. And I'll just, can I just send it to you later with written submissions? Well, you know, you were, you didn't get your act together to do what you are required to do under the rules. And your answer is, let's give the judge more work. Because if I'm timetabling written cost submissions, by the time they're all in, you know, because you can't do them on the, you need somebody needs a week to respond because they're going into discoveries or something else by the time it comes back to me I have to refresh my memory about the entire motion which takes time and then I have to write the cost outline which has to have some background about what, what it was all about which I've already written in my main reasons so if I do costs at the same time I've got a few paragraphs at the end that set out the basic principles, and we all know what they are, right? We all know Zesta, yeah. we all, you know, we all know Davies and Clarington. We all know that things have to be fair and reasonable and reasonable expectations and all of that. We know that it happens with offers that are beaten and offers that aren't. And, you know, we know the factors under Rule 57. None of this is earth shattering. This is all very fact-based discretionary determinations. And it's very easy for me to do that at the end of a set of reasons. And it's much more time consuming for me to do it later. 
So if I have to do it later, because there's a reason, that's fine. But I don't want to do it later and, you know, take twice as long to do it or more because lawyers didn't do what the rules require them to do. So I will often just tell people to upload their costs outlines, especially if I, if I figure it out in advance, I'll tell them to upload them by the day of the motion. Um, and most people are quite content with just relying on the costs outlined. And then when I'm done, after everything, I, I look at the costs outline. And, and if there are offers that are relevant, I tell them to upload them, but clearly mark them. So I don't read them before I've reached a determination on the merits. And then I do costs. Uh, I do them in the, in the main reasons. And, you know, people don't, your clients don't need you to pay for cost submissions that say, here are the cost principles. Like I know that, I know what they are. So that's, if people could get their act together on costs. And you know, the other thing is, if you go to the court of appeal, they all come with a, an agreement on costs. Like how hard is it to call your friend up and say on this, you know, winner takes all motion, what do yeah. we think costs are? And just give me the agreement. We agree that costs are X, right? right? I look, if people would communicate with each other a bit more, there would be less that they would just dump in, in our laps to decide because these things would be amenable to resolution between council. Like we should be here for the things that are not amenable to resolution between council. The things that are amenable to resolution between council should be dealt with at that level, right? That's a more efficient use of your client's resources and it's a more efficient use of judicial resources. I have a question about court file. Remember when court file uh, used to have two functions. One of them was the record of proceedings, a snapshot of what was exchanged and what was decided. And this uh, function, the court file still has. But the second function of court file was the storage of records for hearings. This function is now performed by case lines. Uh, well, we still have an electronic court file, which is not case lines, right? That's because right. So it has to be filed through the portal. Exactly. So that I, I want to talk about that electronic court file from your perspective. So in the old times, in the old times, before summer 2020, we filed materials at, on the 10th floor, and then they brought the materials physically to you to the courtroom or to your chambers. Now we file them electronically, but they what we file electronically through the portal doesn't go to you you don't care about that anymore you care about case lines correct me if i'm wrong no that's right because we don't get the electronic file okay we get case lines so, so i i've had people um assume that i have things that they never uploaded to case lines yeah. and i don't if it's not on case lines i don't have it so it's really interesting. The court file now is purely a record of proceedings for posterity, you know, or, or something like that. Yeah. One of the biggest complaints from lawyers is the extremely high uh, rate of rejection of materials uh, by, by the filing office. Is this within your uh, area of interest or, or uh, expertise? Do you want to talk about that? Or is it purely an administrative matter that you don't really concern yourself with? That, that all happens before I get involved in the process. So it's, um, you know, I, I've heard the complaints and I think, you know, probably there's uh, some discussion happening about how to, how to address it. But Court staff generally are, are uh, employed by the Ministry of the Attorney General, and so there's there's kind of hard lines around um, what what judges uh, like where our responsibility starts and ends. Um, so that's an issue uh, that I've heard, you know, from more than just you. I've heard that from other lawyers, but uh, it is um, I think something that I understand is being looked at. But in terms of specifics, I don't I don't know. Okay. Very Okay, then uh, just to go back to the motion culture and to how the court is uh, attacking the motion culture. Uh, so another issue that lawyers complain about is, is huge delays in uh, getting associate, associate uh, judge dates. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, uh, you're, you're uh, not an associate judge, but I thought I, I'd ask you. So is, is this deliberate in part to attack the motion culture or is it purely because of the backlogs and because of uh, the under-resourced situation? So I'm not in their scheduling office, but um, from what I understand, the associate judges are working incredibly hard and they've got a massive backlog. So if people want to have fewer delays or earlier dates uh, available for associate judges, a lot of the motions before associate judges are amenable to resolution, right? So I sometimes get, because I do do some discovery motions in the class proceedings um, files that I, that I manage. And, um, and sometimes when I conference motions that are coming up, you know, and people, they, they want the, the ability to go and bring a, a motion on refusals before the motion gets heard and then we're timetabling steps. But if, if I have to timetable in a refusals motion before an associate judge, it, it's going to move your end date for the motion off significantly. So what I sometimes suggest if people are willing is that uh, people answer the refusals with the caveat that they do it on a without prejudice basis, that they can still object to the admissibility of the evidence. Now, that doesn't work with privilege and it doesn't work if you think the request is disproportionate. And so you don't wanna put your client to the work and the expense of answering it. But for refusals that can be answered um, with that reserve of rights, it's a much more efficient way of, of moving forward. So. Like there, there are ways you can do it. Like another favorite thing for lawyers to do is to bring motions to strike at the outset of a motion. And they're, they're rarely necessary, right? Like oftentimes people want to strike some small little thing in an affidavit. And, and honestly, all you would have to do is draw my attention to it in submissions. And, you know, like this isn't, this is legal argument, for example, in an affidavit and it's not proper. Well, maybe it is. I can just disregard it, right? Like, yeah. We don't actually need to have a whole motion around it. So it, that, that kind of practicality um, isn't always there. People can get very um, invested in making sure that every I dotted and every T crossed is consistent with the rules of civil procedure. And I mean, that, that puts the cart before the horse, right? Or that's just the tail wagging the dog. The civil procedure rules are there to help us get to a fair and just hearing on the merits. They're not there as some kind of, you know, checklist of things that you have to get through in order to uh, have the right, to earn the right to a fair and just hearing on the merits. And so sometimes people get so wrapped up in minor technical breaches of the rules that they, they lose sight of the forest for the trees. And then, you know, we've got two and a half hours booked for your motion and you want to argue about striking the affidavit for an hour. Well, you know, that's not a good use of time, right? We should be focusing on the issues. Draw my attention to it. I can, I can address it if it's a problem, right? So there, I mean, there are always exceptions, but there's so much yeah. that falls in the range of easy, practical solutions that people don't adopt because they aren't technically consistent with the rules. And, you know, that's, that's just the wrong focus, I think. Yeah, this goes back to your point that lawyers are paranoid, and uh, I, I want to contrast commercialists with civilists. So I think on civilists, lawyers are obsessed with procedure, and on commercialists, they don't care about procedure. <laughs> so maybe uh, civilist lawyers should learn a little bit from commercialist lawyers, although not caring about procedures can have its own um, uh, harms. But I, on, on civilists, I think we definitely shouldn't bring motions to strike paragraphs of affidavits that are not admissible, just say it in your factum, uh, as you said, things like that. So I want to ask you about the effect of Zoom on hearings. At some point, all hearings were on Zoom or most of them were on Zoom. In your experience, what the effect uh, has been, better, worse, any um, material differences, anything that you wanna flag for the bar? Yeah, I mean, I think Zoom has been really useful. And I, I think, especially on like civil motions, for example, it's very, very easy to have an effective civil motion on Zoom. Um, there was a really interesting article in the Advocates Journal recently uh, written by a couple of women about the experiences of racialized women on Zoom, which I thought was 
uh, was really interesting how there, there's an equalizing aspect to Zoom when we all have the same size box. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of pluses to it. From the perspective of uh, the bench, uh, it's like with civil and class proceedings now, I am doing everything virtually. I literally have not set foot in a courtroom since March of 2020. And um, there are, I, I mean, there's a lot of good that's come out of that. We were able to keep the justice system functioning as a result of Zoom, but um, one downside is Zoom fatigue, right? So, yeah. and, and if you're doing a long trial, you'll get a taste of it, but it, lawyers will be, you know, you'll have some hearings, but you won't be every day of your working day on hearings. And I basically am, right? So it does get it does get tiring. Um, we need breaks. We need to take the breaks as uh, uh, regularly as we can, and um, you know. So that's that's a thing. It's another reason to be more focused, right? Is is to try to stave off Zoom fatigue, which is a real thing. Some of my colleagues have talked about digital seasickness. I thankfully have not experienced that, but that can be an issue for some people. So. I think you told me earlier that you can tell, not in this interview, but uh, but prior, you said that you could tell if a lawyer is good or bad, regardless of whether it's Zoom or in person. Sure. So are there some hallmarks that uh, you use? What are they? Well, it's the same, right? It's the same. It's preparation. It's uh, knowledge of the case. It's the the theory you put forward. It's your command of the record, right? So, in in person. Your preparation included knowing where the documents were that you were going to direct me to. That's no different. You just need to know where to direct me to them on case lines now, right? It's the it's the same the same things that make a lawyer effective in a courtroom. Um, you know, adapted to Zoom make a lawyer effective. You don't just become a bad lawyer because you're not used to Zoom. The the one thing. Um, that can be problematic is that you may be a very good lawyer, but you're not used to case lines. And so it gets frustrating because we're, you know, having trouble finding things, but um, assuming that you have, I mean, most, most people who are that good have already taken the time to figure out case lines before they, before they show up to argue their motion, right? They, they've done trial run through, they've figured out how to navigate it. So, um, I, yeah, I don't think it, I, I don't think it's actually significantly different. Yeah. Is it true that case lines is on the way out? Are we going to have a unified filing and uh, hearing software? Is there any word on that, or it's too early to say? I yeah, I'm not privy to those discussions. Okay. I I gather there's some hope for an end to end solution, but I I don't know whether that would involve case lines or not involve case lines. All I can say at this point is that there's been a lot invested in case lines. And it's around for the foreseeable future. And so uh, anybody who's like holding off learning case lines because they think it's all going to change soon and they'll wait for the next one. I mean, look, when we moved into 393 University, it was supposed to be for a few years. And we moved out, what, like 20 some years later. So yeah. <laughs> That's that's a bet I wouldn't take. I, and in the meantime, you need to be functional with case lines to to have your motions heard properly, your hearings heard properly. So, correct. I, I'm bored. So you talked about the workload. You talked about the pressure. You, as a judge, of course, are exposed to things that most lawyers probably are not exposed to. Not just because you're in Zoom all the time, but also because you're exposed to traumatic facts for example, or traumatic cases. Some lawyers practice as, uh, are dedicated to uh, such cases, but most lawyers' practices aren't. How do you deal with trauma in your work? How do you deal with, uh, do you have, I don't know, does the court have a psychologist on staff? How, how does the government support you? Yeah, so there is, um, I think trauma uh, and PTSD in judging is, probably fairly well recognized. Um, and I think probably that started after the uh, Bernardo trials, right? And the jurors um, were offered some support and now we have uh, a service for jurors uh, who, who want somebody to talk to after the end of the trial. Um, we have like many organizations have an EAP that offers uh, counseling services that we have an EAP for judges. Um, 
it is, it's, I think we need to understand better um, trauma in the process as part of better dealing with the trauma from the process. Uh, and that trauma isn't just limited to judges, right? It can be the, the participants, parties, witnesses, jurors, court staff, lawyers. Um, and, and so there are, there's a movement, I think, towards trauma-informed judging, which I think is very positive. Um, and lawyers can help us with that. Um, because, you know, you hear a lot of stories about people who feel re-victimized going through the justice system. And I'm not just talking about complainants and sexual assault cases in criminal court. You know, there's um, a lot of people in, in family disputes who, um, you know, have evidence to give about uh, abuse of all kinds. And um, even in civil cases, people are traumatized in different ways. You know, and there's some, not every civil case is a, you know, a stayed breach contract between two multinationals, right? We've got a lot of, there's a lot of emotion that goes along with the wrongful dismissal. There's a lot of emotion that goes on along with the personal injury case, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot that can impact um, people in the system. So, and sometimes it's not even from the case itself. There's something in the case that evokes past trauma for somebody that I wouldn't necessarily know about as a judge. So if lawyers can help by canvassing with their clients and their, their witnesses, um, whether there's any, you know, anything that could help make things easier for them, um, then that can be raised with the judge at a conference or a pretrial conference or something, or even at the outset of trial or hearing, so that um, we can put in place measures in the course of the hearing to minimize um, the trauma that, that people are likely to suffer personally or or the vicarious trauma that's likely um, or that's possible uh, to come out of somebody's evidence, for example. So I think trauma-informed judging is really important, but we we can't we won't know necessarily what's coming down the pipe that's going to be traumatic if um, if we don't get the heads up and and maybe some ideas from counsel about what would work for that particular person uh, in terms of minimizing their experience of the trauma. Your Honor thousands of lawyers in this province need the information that you provided today i want to thank you for your time this was uh, an extremely valuable discussion i look forward to sharing it with uh, ontario lawyers and i want to wish you all the best in lightening the load and lightening the backlog in uh, your personal mental health and in your personal health all the best to you we should protect our judges at all costs. <laughs> Thank you so well, much. One person on case lines instead of on their books. It's been a it's been a worthwhile hour. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.